All right, so we're in this chapter on gas power systems or cycles. We've covered a lot of material. We're down. We covered the combined cycle last time. Hey, and refresh my memory. Was there two fuel sources in a combined cycle power plant? Do they burn like coal and natural gas? Is that why they call it a combined cycle power plant? Why do they call it a combined cycle power plant? Two different working fluids, two different cycles, a vapor power cycle and a gas power cycle. Exactly right. Anyway, uh, now we're going to talk about aircraft propulsion system. I know some of you still have not flown on an airplane. Some of you have. Probably if you get a degree in engineering, you get a job, blah, 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 you're going to end up some point in your life flying on an airplane. You look out the wing and then you see this big heavy thing hanging underneath. And what is that? Jet engine. How does that work? And we can understand how it works. So I encourage you, I don't have ready to do this today. I'm having problems with the internet and other things. Is uh, aircraft, uh, jet engines, turboprops, turbofans. The general one that we just looked at is a turbofan. That's the majority of type of engines out there. But then you can forget the fan and just have a jet by itself. That's what we'll study. We won't study a turbofan or a turboprop. Um, but there are excellent videos to um, introduce you to the topic of a jet engine aircraft propulsion. All right, so this is a cutaway of a jet engine what doesn't have a turbofan, doesn't have a turboprop. It's just straight, just jet engine. So you come in, air, it goes goes into a compressor section, followed by combustion, followed by turbines, followed by an exhaust, and that exhaust looks like a nozzle, a nozzle, exactly right. So you are familiar with, because we just studied it, the compressor, the combustor, and the turbine. One thing you're looking for is, hey, where's that shaft that maybe comes out here and hooks up to an electric generator? Where's my electric generator hooked up to the shaft of this gas turbine? There isn't one. Now, again, you could have a shaft to go out and drive a propeller, but that's not what we're going to analyze. You could have a shaft that delivers some energy to a big fan in the front. That's the reality of a lot of engines, but we're not going to analyze that. There's no shaft power developed. You're saying, well, if they do a good job of this engine, then where does all that power go? How does this thing work? So, so what the main purpose of a jet engine is to generate internal energy, momentum, kinetic energy, thrust, or high temperature. Who would like to answer that? Only call, raise your hand. All right, you get the opportunity. Thrust. Now, have you ever heard of the word thrust before? He's correct. What is thrust? In the way that you can tell if a student has heard of thrust and knows a little bit about thrust, is they can tell me what are the SI units of thrust. This one, I'm going to pause. I'm going to walk around and look over your shoulder and see your notes as you answer this one. And I'll go around and look. You answer the question, what are the units of thrust? He's exactly right. This jet engine is the purpose is to generate thrust. What are the SI units of thrust? How many people pass dynamics? Yes, and thrust is in dynamics. How many people have are in fluids or pass fluids? Definitely in fluid, fluid mechanics. It's a good review, a little bit of fluid mechanics. So thrust is a force. It's a force. Now, you have this engine here, and I'm going to kind of shape it like this. And maybe this is the intake, and this is the exhaust of the engine. Air comes in here. It's mixed with a little fuel. Exhaust goes out there, right? Uh, the mass flow rate of the intake is really close to the mass flow rate of the exhaust. There's a little bit of fuel added, but not like gobs and gobs of fuel. It's primarily the mass flow rate of the intake is so close to the mass flow rate of the exhaust, they're the same in first approximation. Okay. Now, somebody says uh, the jet engine thrust having units of like force, like the Newtons, is caused by high 
temperature, no, high exhaust pressure, not high exhaust temperature. So the pressure over here compared to the pressure on the intake. Uh, if I was a clicker working, I'd say, hey, is the pressure on the intake less, equal, or greater? Answer A, B, or C, or you could even call true, false. Let me do this. Let me get rid of this true, false. The pressure on the intake versus the pressure on the exhaust. Is the pressure on the intake less than the pressure on the exhaust, or equal to, or greater than the pressure? So answer A, B, or C. I'm going to pause and walk around. Those that have passed fluid mechanics have a huge advantage. A huge advantage. All right, let me try and uh, refresh memory a little bit, or if you haven't taken fluids, expose you to some concepts in fluids. If I have a garden hose, how many people have ever seen a garden hose? And uh, that's the end of the garden hose, and out comes a stream of water, like that. Have you seen that? Have you ever held a garden hose and just seen the stream of water coming out the end? Right? It's on full blast. There's no nozzle at the end or anything. Uh, what's the pressure right there in the middle of the water stream at the exit of the water hose? All right. So you're driving down the road. This is my rendition of a car. There's your window. And the airstream is going like this. I know that there's some movement around it because by the front end and the windshield and all that pushing the air around because you're moving around. But let's say I think about the air right here, a couple, at least a foot out. Maybe how far can you reach your window? I don't want you to do this and cause an accident, but how far can you stick your hand comfortably out the window of the car? Maybe a foot or two? Yeah, maybe two foot. What's the air pressure in the air right there, two foot out of your window? How does it compare to the air pressure half a mile in front of your car, half a mile behind your car? They're the same pressure. Does that make But, Professor, I stick my hand out there. I can feel the pressure. It's whipping my hand back. It's whipping my hand back. Hey, Professor, I can stick my finger right in front of this water jet. I know it's high pressure. I put my thumb there, my finger there. I can feel it pushing on my thumb or finger. I know it's high pressure. It can't be the same pressure. And just like this, most people think, oh, gas jet. I'll put my conceptually my hand in front of it right there at the exit. I'll feel the pressure. It's going to be pushed back. But what's the pressure right there at the exit compared to the pressure right here? Compared to the pressure right there, compared to the pressure right there, compared to the pressure, it's atmospheric pressure. Same with this. If I put the pressure here, pressure here, pressure there, I didn't say the pressure inside the hose was the same. I said the water leaving the nozzle, right at the exit of the nozzle, what is that pressure of the water? Atmospheric pressure. How about over here? It's atmospheric pressure. Over here, it's whatever that atmospheric pressure is at that elevation. You know, you typically the engines could be at high elevation. It's lower pressure. Same as here. Then somebody says, well, that don't make any sense. Because what about this nozzle? I thought at the end of the nozzle, at the exit of the nozzle, not the beginning of the nozzle. Inside the jet engine, yeah, there's some high pressure. How about even before the turbine? Yeah, real high. Right there where the compressor is, or the combustor, right after the compressor. It's real high. It's not atmospheric pressure. We're talking, but this is a very, very common misconception about jet engines. Somehow thrust is generated because I have a high pressure on the exit and a low pressure on the inlet. A delta P gives me a push. As a mechanical engineer, do you want to have that misconception? No, no, no. You want to think correctly. There's a thing called in fluid mechanics Euler's equation. Talks about the curvature of the streamline, the pressure as it goes across the curvature of the streamline and the different radius. What's the curvature or the radius of curvature for these streamlines that are parallel? Infinity. So what's the pressure difference as I march from this interior into the middle? You know, no pressure difference. Remember that? Euler's equation. Fluid mechanics, those that have already passed fluids, you, you, you have an advantage over the other students or those that are going to see it soon. But the same thing here. This is a jet stream coming out like that. It doesn't come out like this. Is that the way it comes out of a nozzle or a jet engine? No, it doesn't. 
it comes out in a, a stream like this. The pressure is the same. So that's a common misconception here. The jet engine thrust is caused by high exhaust pressure. True or false? Big time false. But you'll have to explain that to people because a lot of people will get that wrong. Okay. So what gives you the thrust? What gives you the jet? How does the jet engine develop thrust? That's a complicated question as well. But think about you have your engine like this. You do your little control volume, right? And you have the mass flow rate coming in on the inlet with its velocity on the inlet. You have the same approximately mass flow rate, neglect and flow rate of fuel being added, exiting, and you have the velocity in the exit. From this little control volume, we already talked about the pressure on the inlet's about the same as the pressure on the exit. It's not a force due to force per unit area pressure difference. It's not that. It's related to, in dynamics, you had the M times V. In fluid mechanics, you have the M dot times V. So in dynamics, you learned about, what was this called? Mass times the velocity is called the momentum, the linear momentum. If I take something and throw it at you, I would never do that. Or you take something and throw it at me, that's what you're thinking about doing, but don't do it. You have, you know, the object's going at a certain speed with its mass, that's, you can get the momentum. That's a linear momentum of that object. In fluid mechanics, you don't talk about just one little particle. You talk about a stream of them, a bunch of little ones after another and after another. You talk about the mass flow rate, the mass flow rate times the same velocity that it's you know, going at. That's called the linear momentum flow rate. Right? All right. So when you do uh, the linear momentum balance, uh, it's like a, a F equal MA or if you, Newton, whose, whose equation is that? Newton's first, second, second, look, second, right? Isn't that Newton's second? Sometimes they write it like this. F is equal to the time rate of change of MV. Remember that? Instead of A, they put that. Or they say, hey, M isn't changing like that. So what's happening is, is the velocity on the inlet compared to the velocity on the exit, are they approximately the same for a jet engine? No, the velocity on the exit, if you want a large thrust, is a lot higher. What is higher? The linear momentum flow rate going out the back. How do you get something to change its momentum? You have to have a force imbalance. So somewhere inside this control volume is a force pushing the gases that way from fluid mechanics then you think about it okay well if you push on me i push back on you i think that's something about a third law of newton that means that something is feeling a forward push like this the bottom of the wing of the aircraft that the engine strapped on is feeling the forward thrust the gas is going through the engine or fueling a backward push to get them to flow out the back with a higher linear momentum flow rate. And so we talk about thrust uh, back basically is what the aircraft feels. The engine's turned on, the engine's throwing the gases out at the back of the engine at high speed, and it feels a forward propelling motion to thrust to move it down the tarmac and runway and then up into the sky. And that thrust keeps going no matter if you leave the sky, leave the ground anymore, right? It's just dependent on how fast you can throw this out compared to how fast it's being ingested. And the basic equation is the thrust is the mass flow rate through the system times the change in the speed of the gases. Done. Isn't that simple? Very easy. Now let's move on. So this is how we model a gas turbine or a jet engine. The compressor, the combustor, the turbine are all the same. You've seen them before. But what's new on the front end? 
diffuser. Okay, what uh, have you ever modeled the diffuser, analyzed the diffuser? Professor, I, was, I analyzed so many diffusers in Thermo 1. You wouldn't believe how many diffuser calculations I did in Thermo 1. I did them here, did them there. Yeah, good. They're, we're going to redo them. And then what's back over here? A nozzle. You ever analyzed the nozzle? First law, second law of a nozzle? Sure. Thermo 1. You did a lot of nozzles. Guess what? We need to use that information that you learned in Thermo 1 here. But we already did the compressor. We know how to handle the compressor efficiency. We already did the turbine. You know how to handle the turbine efficiency. We know how to handle the combustor, the burner. Sure. So what is the purpose of a diffuser? A little review from Thermo 1. Yeah, so if a typical diffuser is shaped like this, if it's subsonic, meaning the area is getting bigger and bigger for the air coming in. So it basically slows the air down. That's what a diffuser does. What does a nozzle do? A subsonic nozzle looks like this. Its area is getting smaller and smaller in the direction of flow. Guess what it's doing? It's the opposite of a diffuser. It's speeding it up. So the diffuser slows it down and the nozzle speeds it up. So right away you see that in, at state one, the kinetic energy at state one, that's related to the speed at one, and the kinetic energy at two, and the kinetic energy at three, and the kinetic energy at four are all negligible. But because the purpose of this engine is to kick out at high exit speed V sub B, do you think the one-half VB squared, which is the kinetic energy at B, is negligible? No, it's not negligible. We want a high exit speed. And if you're flying really fast in air, you could have a high entrance speed. So the velocity at A could be pretty fast. Think about an aircraft moving along. So that the kinetic energy at A is not negligible. It's one-half VA squared. Some cases it could be negligible if you're flying really slow, but if you're flying pretty fast, it's not negligible. All right. So right away, remember the kinetic energy everywhere else inside the cycle, except for the entrance and the exit is negligible. Okay. Now let's do this. Can you remember how to do a control volume around the diffuser and how to do the first law? What's the first law going to give us? Is there any shaft work in or out of the diffuser? Nope. Any heat transfer in or out? Nope. Negligible change in elevation? So it's just basically going to slow down the flow. It has kinetic energy coming in. So the first law for the diffuser gives us that the inlet enthalpy at A plus the inlet kinetic energy at A is equal to the exit enthalpy at 1. That's it. That makes sense? So the one-half VA squared is equal to C sub P, T1 minus TA. Let me ask you this. Looking at this equation, did I make any algebraic errors or it look okay? Does it look okay? All right. Can, do you think the temperature at 1 compared to the temperature at A, do you think it's greater, equal, or less? I know that I don't have my clickers working and I don't want to walk around too much. So I'll take a brave soul who will raise their hand and answer this question. The temperature at A versus the temperature at 1. Hey, there's no heat transfer. It's a nozzle or a diffuser. First student would say, oh, if there's no heat transfer, there's no temperature difference. But are they right? No, don't fall for that trap. So let's get rid of that answer. Which one is higher? Who would like to get my attention? And then, okay, you're very brave. Go for it. T1, T1 is greater? Yes. All right. So T1 is higher. If T1 is higher, then this is a positive. C sub P, positive, you multiply them together, positive, you have a positive inlet speed. Actually, as this speed is higher and higher, you get a more significant increase in T1. You're correct. All right. Now, do you really want to handle the isentropic efficiency of a diffuser? The answer is N-O. 
Yes, you can look back in the chapter and you can handle the isentropic efficiency of a diffuser. I think on my doctoral qualifying exam, the people asked me like, oh, I know you can handle the isentropic efficiency compressors and this and turbines, but I want you to recall from memory on the fly in front of about five people who look mean and nasty, uh, the isentropic efficiency of either a diffuser, I forget it was, or a, or a nozzle, and I couldn't remember. No, we don't want to do that. What do we want to assume about this diffuser, as well as when we get to the nozzle? What type of flow do we want to handle going through it? Think second law. Isentropic. Isentropic flow. All right. So you have a temperature difference. We already talked about that. So how about this equation? T2 over T1 is equal to P2 over P1 to the K minus 1 over K. Isn't that isentropic equation or general equation for isentropic process ideal gas? What we're going to do is we're going to say for this application, our exit is 1, our entrance is A. Our exit is 1, our entrance is A. Did I apply the equation correctly? What does this? This is for, I need an equal sign. This is for the isentropic uh, relationship for the slowing down of the flow. So right away, it's like, if you're given the speed, you can calculate the temperature at 1. If you're then calculated the temperature at 1, you can now calculate the pressure increase. Won't P1 be greater? Yeah, it's slowing it down, recovering pressure, or building the pressure. That's what a diffuser does. It's been a long time, Professor, since I analyzed the diffuser. Well, this is a review, and hopefully it helped. All right? Now, the next thing, maybe what we want to do is jump over and talk about the nozzle. If I do a nozzle, if I do a first law analysis of the nozzle, it'll look like the first law analysis of that diffuser, will it not? I'll have the kinetic, not the kinetic, the enthalpy at 4 uh, is equal to the enthalpy at B, the exit, plus the one-half VB squared. So if I want to calculate the speed V sub B, often I don't know that I want to calculate it, I need to get the C sub P and then T4 minus T uh, B uh, equal to one-half VB squared. See how you do that? So if I'm look like th typically V sub A is given, then I'm able to get T sub 1, then I'm able to get P sub 1. That's the strategy for the diffuser. What about the nozzle? I'm looking to get the velocity at B. Let me clean that up a little bit. So I need to get the temperature at B. How am I going to get the temperature B? Well, think about using the same equation for isentropic flow through that nozzle. So the temperature at B divided by the temperature at 4 is equal to the pressure at B divided by the pressure at 4 to the K minus 1 over K. Does that make sense? So for a good nozzle to work, I really want PB... I'm sorry, P4. Should P4 be much, much greater than PB to push it through? You bet. You really want the high pressure at 4. If the high pressure at 4 gives you the basically the low temperature at TB, and the low temperature at TB gives you a high velocity at exit. So the equations are basically the same for the nozzle, isentropic flow through the nozzle, isentropic flow through the diffuser. All right. Well, when we analyzed the previous problem where we had a compressor and a turbine, basically we talked about the pressure increase. We talked about P2 over P1, that pressure ratio across the compressor. And we also talked about P3 and P4. That was like the pressure ratio across the turbine. You have studied these for power production, the gas turbine cycle, uh, gas turbines. But um, for this case, are these equal? Not if you want a high pressure at four. If your goal is to have a high pressure at four, they're not equal. 
So what happens is, is you find out that this pressure increase across the compressor is greater than, I know it's a, I'm writing it, P3 is higher than P4, than the pressure decrease across the turbine. That'll throw students for a loop. They're like, what? I, I'm so used to saying that if this goes up by 8, this goes down by 1 eighth, but it doesn't. Well, then how do I calculate what the exit pressure for that turbine is? You have to go back to work consideration. Before, the work that came out of the turbine, WT, you subtracted off some WC, and that was work net. But do I have another shaft feeding a generator, feeding a propeller, feeding a fan? I do not. So guess what WC is compared to WT? Forget the minus sign. I know one's negative, but what is it? The magnitudes are equal. The turbine only generates enough power to run the compressor, meaning that it only drops the pressure so far to achieve the goal of feeding the work back to the compressor. All right? I've hit all the high, part, high points, or maybe you might think low points, all the challenging parts of the analysis. All right? So let's solve a problem. So air enters the turbojet engine at 26 kilopascal, 230 Kelvin. Tell me a little bit about this pressure. High pressure, low pressure? Yeah. I mean, is what's the pressure in this room right here? 100. It's basically it's high altitude. This is aircraft engines operating at high altitude. What about this temperature? Tell me a little bit about that temperature. You know, it's pretty cold air up there at that high altitude. All right. Uh, has inlet velocity. They give it to us. So we'll have the inlet kinetic energy. We'll put it through the diffuser and slow it down. The air mass flow rate is given. The air is slowed first in the diffuser. The pressure ratio across the compressor is 11. There is negligible pressure drop through the combustor. The turbine inlet temperature is 650 Kelvin. The isentropic efficiency of the compressor and the turbine are given. The work developed by the turbine equals the compressor. They did not have to say that, but because they said it, it reaffirms exactly what I've been trying to emphasize. There's no net power out of this cycle. Okay. The diffuser and nozzle are isentropic. Good luck if they weren't. I know you can do it. You just have to go back to Chapter 6 and review the isentropic efficiencies. But let's not do that. I don't think any problems have isentropic efficiency for either a nozzle or a diffuser. They're all assumed isentropic. Operation is steady state. Good. There's no transient calculations in all the chapter. And assume constant specific heat so that we don't have to do a lot of interpolation in the air tables. Makes life a little easier. I didn't say it was more accurate. Just said it was a little easier. And here is a K and a lower. So they changed the effective temperature. It's not a cold air standard analysis. That K is a little higher temperature than for the... Uh, cold air standard analysis. Okay, what's the velocity at the nozzle exit and the thrust developed? Too easy. Easy, simple. No, you have to do a lot of calcs. So let's just kind of go through them. The same equations I outlined, and maybe we have time for you to run some numbers on your calculator. So let's take a look. Let's draw our diffuser like this. Subsonic diffuser, typical. I'm trying to emphasize that the cross-sectional area is increasing. That's why it slows down. All right. So we have to find the temperature at state 1, given the temperature at state A is 230 Kelvin. From a first law, we calculated that the temperature at 1 is equal to 1 half the velocity at A squared divided by the specific heat constant pressure uh, plus the temperature at A. Did I do that okay? It was our first law, wasn't it? Okay. All right. We know the temperature at A. So that's 230. We have this one-half velocity squared. What's our velocity? 180 meters 
squared per second squared. Specific heat, 1.10 kilojoule per kilogram degree Kelvin or just Kelvin. Okay, fine. Guess what? Most students, they say, ah, just ignore units. They'll work themselves out. You'll get some funky answers. How many people got them crazy Wally plus answers last homework set, that last problem? Like the speed of sound was probably, I didn't calculate the Mach number, but it's probably Mach 1,000. But I don't think it's going Mach 1,000. <laughs> you know, some ridiculous speed. Anyway, what you have to remember that the unit conversion that one thousand meter squared per second squared is precisely one kilojoule per kilogram and don't forget that anyway you get a, an exit temperature t1 from that temperature I can get that the pressure at one compared to the pressure at a is equal to the temperature one to the temperature a ratio not to the k minus one over k but to the k divided by k minus one so do you want to run some numbers or not? I have the numbers on the next page. I can look at them if you like. No? So let me jump to the next page. So this is the kinetic energy. I like to calculate the kinetic energy in kilojoules per kilogram. And then I use that kinetic energy. I add it to the, or use the equation to convert to the higher temperature is now 252 at, at T1. Knowing that temperature, use that pressure equation that I just showed to go from 26 to 36.9 pressure. At this point, what do I have here? I'm calculating the speed of sound in air at the temperature of the air of 230. It's 299. I'm checking this speed with that speed. It's actually flying at 0.74 Mach. That's pretty common, that high, commercial airline. Okay, so then we go through the compressor. There's two parts to the compressor. You use the isotropic efficiency of the compressor. You've done enough of those. The temperature is given at the exit of the combustor. The hard part, not going through the turbine, but to recall... Let me write out the equations here. You start with that the work that the turbine produces is exactly the work needed to drive the compressor. What is the equation for the work to drive the compressor? Isn't it the T2 minus T1? What's the work needed to the, out of the turbine? C sub P, T3 um, minus T4. You cancel the C sub P's. Professor, is that T4S or T4 actual? Which T do we calculate from this equation? Oh, you did? Did I make a mistake? You both have it? What's your temperature? Maybe I have a different uh, speed or something. Uh, 220? Did I have the same number? 220? 180. Uh -huh. I changed speed on you. I know it. It's bad. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> wow. I'm embarrassed I let you down. Okay. Well, you're a pretty tough guy. You'll suffer it or you'll survive. All right. Um, yeah, I did change the speed, didn't I? Sorry about that. Yeah, it's 220. These are the numbers here for this problem, and I guess I redid it. All right, so this is the temperature for, when you calculate that temperature for, it's this 1142.9. Maybe what I should do is pause a little bit and make sure. Thank you for checking me. Can some people check that this is the right T4, given this equation, where this is our T1? That's our T2, and our T3 is given. You see what we're doing?
Maybe I'll get my calculator and do it too. One correct thank you, one confirmation, two thank you, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one more, ten. So eleven, twelve, thank you. So okay, so I have it. That's actually we calculated T4 from an energy point of view that compressor the the compressor is driven by the turbine. The turbine only produces that much, that amount of work to drive the compressor. Now, you are given an isentropic efficiency of that turbine. You're kind of working the equations backwards from the way you normally work it. That's why. You do not know this pressure right here. You're trying to get the 169 pressure. So what you do is you go back to your efficiency equation for the turbine. That was the work that the turbine produces if it was isentropic divided by the work the turbine produces actual the C sub P T3 minus T4S divided by C sub P T3 minus T4 actual the C sub P's cancel and you get the equation for T4S T4S is T3 uh, um, plus the efficiency of the turbine, T4, uh, uh, maybe it's a minus sign in there. Let me do this. T3 minus T4 actual, and then this is subtracting. It's going to be lower than T3. So how about you run that and see if you get 1114.4. One. Oh, question. Oh, yeah, actual. That's right. Actual over isentropic. Sorry. So that messes up my equation, doesn't it? So it's... Um, One over, is that right? That doesn't look right to me. T4, oh, I'm trying to get S. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. Point 0.9, divide by point 0.9. Get rid of this. I'm trying to do too much algebra, huh? Uh... Maybe I should take more steps. Anybody confirm the number you did? Was it my original equation? No. So I divide by efficiency. Divide by 90%? Yes. Oh, that's right. Yep, you're correct. It's a lower temperature. T4S is lower than T4 actual. Got it. All right, so this is actual. That's correct. Now, once I have this temperature, I could finally get the pressure because we remember that the temperature um, 4S divided by temperature 3 is equal to P4S divided by P3. You can put the, uh, the K minus 1 over K there, or you could put it over here, um, K over K minus 1. And then that allows us to calculate... P4S is equal to P3 times T4S divided by T3 to the K divided by K minus 1. How about you run that to see if that gives us our 169 kilopascal. Did you get it, or did I have an error? No, we're just wondering how you got um, T2 and T2. How I got which one? T2 and T2. Can you explain it? 
Um, let me let me check to see if we get this 169. Any one, two, three, four. I got four correct on five on 169, six, seven, eight, nine. Thank you very much. Okay. So now uh, this is what drives this pressure difference. Uh, I know this one is probably should be called B or something consistent with the book or state five on the exit. This pressure difference is what drives the isentropic flow through the nozzle. All right. So it's the same type of equations. It's isentropic flow through the nozzle. So we have the pressure difference. So we find T5 is equal to T4 times P5 divided by P4 to the K minus 1 over K. So we know we're going back to 26 kilopascal. That's the inlet pressure. That's the exit pressure. Uh, and uh, we know that we can have 169. So <clears throat> our temperature at 4 is 1142.9. Then we have the pressure 26 divided by 1 to the 0.4 divided by 1.4. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've messed up our K value. Let's see what I'm using for K value. 1.352 even. Oh, boy. Well, I'm going to say that that different K, not 1.4, is used, and it gets to be about 702. Now that it's 702, I go back to my energy equation. And my energy equation for the nozzle is that the... Uh, one half velocity at five squared is equal to C sub P times the enthalpy change. It came in at 1142.9 and it goes out at 702. You want a big temperature difference for the energy change, the enthalpy change, and you get the speed of 986. So it came in at 220, it exited at 986. Calculate the speed of sound at that exit temperature. Notice it's uh, 702, so it's a higher speed of sound. Um, but what you find here is that it's a Mach number of 1.8. So right away, I want to transition and talk about subsonic, supersonic flow, the last big topic of this chapter. Okay? You ready for this? Okay. So the compressible flow is the last big topic of this chapter. We want to talk about the speed of sound, talk about the Mach number, and then we want to talk about nozzles, especially converging, diverging nozzles. But there's a lot of very interesting behavior that happens when you have compressible flow and you have things going around the speed of sound or faster. Here is a Navy jet approaching the sound barrier. The white halo is formed by condensed water droplets which result from the shock wave shedding from the aircraft at the tail end as well as around the canopy. Very interesting pictures and photos occur. First thing is, is we need to get an equation for the speed of sound. This is a very general equation. It says, how does the pressure change with respect to density if I have some isentropic change or disturbance to the flow, like a speed, you know, that's what it is. It's a bump, a pressure difference, and I take the square root. So the speed of sound is related to how the pressure changes with respect to density if it's isentropic process. Okay, how do you derive that equation? Well, the trip traditional one-dimensional derivation has some stationary fluid and then on the uh, left side there's some disruption. Think about a piston just popping and moving. It creates a disturbance. The disturbance uh, moves at the speed C through this one-dimensional chamber and before it the fluid is all stationary. It doesn't even know something's coming at it. It's at enthalpy H, pressure P, rho, density rho, and then on the back side, oops, it's felt the presence of the 
wave coming through at the speed of sound. So its enthalpy changes from H to H plus delta H. P from P to P does delta P. Rho is rho plus delta rho. So we have this moving wave front. Think about the velocity at an instant in time. Right there is the position of that wave front behind it. It's moving at delta V in front of it. Doesn't know anything's happened yet. It's just sitting there stationary. Likewise for pressure. Do a little control volume in closing the wavefront. The control volume is moving at the speed of sound. It's not accelerating or decelerating. It's moving at that speed C. So from the perspective of somebody sitting at that wavefront, it looks like flow is coming in on the right at what speed C and leaving on the left at V minus delta V. It looks like it's enthalpy, pressure, and density are what's coming in on the right and the difference, you know, H plus delta H and P plus delta P, those are the pressure, density, and enthalpy leaving on the left. For that control volume, do a mass balance. What that says is what flows in on the right has to be the same flows out the left. Mass has to be conserved. Well, the mass is a product of rho A and with times the velocity. Likewise, over here, you put in the density, but it's not just rho. It's rho plus delta rho. The A hasn't changed. The A cancels on both sides. And then the C minus dV, that's the difference. That's the, the outgoing on the velocity on the left. Now, what you do is you look at the small term times the small term, and you neglect it. You neglect the higher order terms, but then you're left with this equation. It looks kind of funny, but it's a differential equation. So it says speed times a change in the density minus rho times dV is equal to zero. Don't worry about it. We'll use it in a minute. This is highly mathematical. Let's look at the energy balance equation. Does this look familiar? I have what's flowing in. It's enthalpy plus kinetic energy. On the, on the left side, I have its enthalpy, not the same as what's H on the right. And then I have its kinetic energy. Does that look familiar? Again, neglect dV squared, the higher order term. You get this as reduced energy balance. Mass equation, energy equation. You go to, you could do the second law, but the more direct is think about TDS relation. And this is the relation we'd like to use. Does that look familiar out of chapter six? Yeah, vaguely. We're going to say it's isentropic behavior. So ds is equal to zero. And now you have this third equation. What do you think with those three differential equations you do? I couldn't fit it on one page. We go to the next page. You take your mass, your energy, and your isentropic relationship, and you combine them for a final simple c. So c squared is equal to. Um, it's algebra at that point. You have to trust me a little bit, dot, dot, dot. But this is with the assumption that it's isentropic. That was one of the equations, the second law. Hence, you take the square root. You get equation that we wanted to. There's the equation for the speed of sound. It's in your physics textbook. Oh, almost guarantee it. It's somewhere in your <laughs> physics textbook. But my guess is the instructor skipped that part. Also, it's in your fluid mechanics textbook. But maybe the fluid mechanics instructor doesn't like compressible flow. Maybe the fluid ins mechanics instructor loves compressible flow and derives this. I don't know. All right, let's move on. It's in our thermo book for sure. It's in this chapter. You want to apply it for air. Well, what do you have to do for air? I have to say, can you get me the relationship between pressure as a function of density and entropy, I'm going to hold the entropy variable constant and I'm going to differentiate that function with respect to density. Uh, yeah, okay, I can do that. Well, here you go. This is the derivation. You remember PV to the K is equal to a constant for an ideal gas undergoing the isentropic process. Is this one of your favorite equations now? Oh, absolutely. So now what you do is you replace for P. P is the constant divided by V to the K. Differentiate it. So that's what we do. P is equal to the constant. And then we have, okay, rho to the K. Rho, rho is the reciprocal of V. All right. So you know now you just turn on your mathematical and you do the differentiation. 
and uh, you substitute for what the constant is. That constant is P V to the K. Put that in there. And uh, it works out that it's equal to the square root of K R T. What again is K? Ratio of specific heats. For air, room temperature, about 1.4. What is R? R is the gas, universal gas constant divided by the molar mass. For air, it's a particular number. What is T? I uh, forgot what T is. T. What is T? T. Mm, I forgot. What is T? Temperature. Oh, put in degree C. Oh, it must be in Kelvin. So square root of KRT. All people that have worked in compressible flow will remember that equation. The, the speed of sound, constant specific heats, and something like air is, or any ideal gas, square root of KRT. We take and say, hey, here is a value of R for air. Here is a temperature. 0 degrees C, 273 Kelvin. Use 1.4 for the constant specific heats. I can run that equation and get about 331 meters per second. I go look on the internet for some site. Oh, air at 0 degrees C. It agrees. The equation looks good. I can change the temperature to 20 degrees C. What happens to the speed of sound in air? It's, a, it's, it's proportional to the square root of T. It goes up hotter the air, the faster it is. Uh, helium. Uh, yes, helium, ideal gas, same temperature. Compare the speed of sound in helium compared to air. Same temperature. Hey, professor, does the speed of sound of air change if I change the pressure? Look at the equation. No. Square root of KRT. Where is the pressure in here? It's not. Now, if you boost the pressure so much that it stops behaving as an ideal gas, well, don't use this equation. But see this is much higher? Sometimes, I've never done this, I've never been at a little kid's birthday party where they have helium balloons, but some students have told me that they like to get the little balloon and they like to take it and they like to breathe that helium in their lungs and then they like to talk. Maybe you've seen somebody do that at a little kid's party. And what do they sound like when they talk and what's coming out through their lungs is all helium? They sound really funny because of the difference in the speed of sound. All right. Um, you could do that for hydrogen. You could do that for carbon monoxide. Go to a party where carbon monoxide's in built <laughs> balloons. and it, Don't do that. No, 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 no. Helium is inert. It doesn't want to participate with anything in your lung. All right. Very good. All right. Carbon monoxide would not be good to take a deep breath of that. You would not be happy. Same with hydrogen. Let's move to Mach number. Mach number is simply the ratio of the speed of the air at the current condition compared to the speed of sound in the air at that current condition, current temperature. You could also have the speed of an object compared to the speed of sound. So the aircraft could be going. So they talk about Mach number is actual speed of the gas compared to its speed of sound in the gas or the speed of the object compared to the speed of sound in the gas. What happens if it's subsonic? Mach is less than 1. Sonic, Mach is 1. Transonic, Mach is around 1. A little below, a little above, it's in that transonic region. Supersonic, Mach number is greater than 1. Hypersonic, okay, you're in a rush. You really want to get there fast, and it's not just a little greater, but it could be. I don't know the transition between hypersonic and supersonic. Maybe it's 5 Mach, maybe it's 10 Mach, but believe me, people are pushing the limits. They want actually weapon systems to deploy quickly. That's the big application of a lot of things in hypersonics. Okay. We have a converging nozzle. We've just studied the converging nozzle, did we not? You know, I can make up this problem like this. Hey, the inlet temperature is 300 Kelvin. The inlet pressure is 120 kilopascal. The exit pressure is 100 kilopascal. What drove the flow through the nozzle? A pressure difference of 20 kilopascal. Can you calculate the exit temperature? Yeah, it comes out a little colder. Can you calculate the exit speed? Yes, we can calculate that. No problem. You can do that. And now, can you calculate the exit Mach number? No problem. It comes out of Mach about 0.53.
I change the problem a little bit and I say only thing I change only thing I change is this exit pressure I'm sorry the inlet pressure so 100 to 220 kilopascal so it still exits at 100 kilopascal what drives the pressure difference a delta P of 120 kilopascal I ask the same questions can you calculate the temperature well it comes out even colder of that nozzle it comes out even faster of that nozzle and then I ask calculate the Mach number remember it was 0.5 it comes out 1.14 right away this is not possible out of a nozzle that is purely a converging nozzle a lot of you probably understand this if I said I want you to draw a cartoon of a rocket the nozzle on a rocket that's going to lift off and shoot something at high speed into space this you would have a pinching down section then a bend throat and then an expanding section this is a converging section of the nozzle this is a diverging section of a nozzle with the converging diverging nozzle you can get very low pressures but more importantly very high velocities you can get this coming out at greater than Mach 1 if I only have a converging nozzle, no matter how hard I push, P1, I'm sorry, yeah, is much, much greater than P2, the exit right here, you can push, push, push all you want. It's going to get to be Mach 1 right here, and then you're going to have a S-H-O-C-K, shock. Shocks are not isentropic, and they have a very abrupt change to the physics across them and this is why you get loud sounds all right somebody's in a shop they have an air nozzle on the side of the shop wall right and they walk over and they have they just open it up all the way okay you think from your experience if you've been in a shock and you have the airline and they open a valve and just open up the atmosphere do you think it's going to be quiet like hey I can't hear that what is that is, it, is that valve or is it going to be loud your experience it's loud you're hearing basically shock it's mock flow somewhere in that constriction and then you're getting shot loud same with the muffler I talked about when it cracks the valve on the exhaust valve and that immediate rush going out of the head into the exhaust manifold loud it's Mach 1 the choked flow there's plenty of applications in your present day behavior and one of the things you could talk to anybody that studied this stuff you, and we'll show it next time you talk to Johnson you talk to Dr. Combs other people and they'll, they'll rattle off right away you don't need a great pressure difference across something to generate shocks on the outlet really you just need about 15 psi differential you just need about that much that's all how about this air stem anybody taken and relieved the little air pressure out of their tire is it quiet or is it noisy why is it noisy we're going to study that next time i hope you have a great spring break thank you for your attention